I'm really excited to be here. Um, this is my first time in Charleston and to have such an amazing crowd on a night like this is, is really wonderful. I'm part of the launch of a brand new organization that's focusing on tactical urbanism, I mean, that's, that's amazing. That's, you know, I haven't heard of a group like Enough Pi with this explicit mission um, you know, ever. So this is really exciting what their mission is here in, in Charleston. Uh, it's been great to learn about the last couple of days. Get familiar with your city. Like I said, this is my first time here, so I've been counting a personal crash course on what's going on um, and what the mission is for this for this group. Um, so tonight I'm going to be talking about this really this really wonky term that we coin and somehow people like to repeat it. It's called tactical urbanism. Can I see a show of hands for people who have heard of this before? Just so I know. Very few of you. Okay, great. This is all going to be somewhat new material. I hope it's um, inspirational. Um, and who am I talking to tonight? Do we have planners in the room? You see your hands. A few architects. All right, a lot. Designers, engineers, uh, activists, students. Okay, a lot of students. Great. Um, who got dragged here by somebody else? A few. All right. Um, I'll try and get through this quickly for you. All right. Moving on. So a quick overview of what I'm going to be talking about tonight. Um, Really, what we do at Street Plans and why we do it. Um, you know, we are a consulting firm, but we have some pretty explicit mission behind what we do. Um, I'll explain this concept of tactical urbanism. Um, we'll go over some of the key characteristics and the trends and what's really growing and, and uh, feeding into this movement at the moment. Um, I'll share case studies of about ten or eleven of those, which really illustrate these ideas, um, which I find to be really, really compelling and interesting. Um, it's really hard for me actually to, to share these case studies because I want to share all of them, and so it's like picking a set list each time I do a presentation. Um, but I hope you like the ones I'm sharing tonight. Um, some concluding thoughts, and I'll talk just a, really briefly about the opportunities for tactical urbanism um, in the Upper Peninsula. Um, these projects, you know, again, they're, they're not just top-down, they're not just bottom-up. We're seeing this process where you've got citizen activists and community groups, you know, joining together to make change, but also cities are helping out and partnering with communities and, and helping them and supporting them to make change at the neighborhood level, and also starting to do, you know, instigate projects themselves in collaboration with developers and entrepreneurs and uh, business improvement districts, um, nonprofits, etc. So this is really kind of a, a diagram I think that explains, uh, um, you know, part, part of what Enough Pi's mission is. You know, it's bringing everybody together to to work and make better places. Uh, this is not going to come through on the screen, but the point here is that you know, you've got your tacticians and you've got tactics. And what we've been studying is how they go from unsanctioned to sanctioned. And so often these projects do start without real formal permission, but then they gain acceptance and they become permanent, or the city says, hey, that's a great idea, we're going to get behind it. So that's what's really exciting about, to me personally, about our research is finding those early tactics that were unsanctioned and kind of guerrilla and really um, interesting, and then following them to see if they scale, if they move along that, that spectrum. So to start, DIY crosswalks. Um, this is one of the more simple things that you could do to make a neighborhood more walkable. Yet you go through almost any American city and many, many neighborhoods, and getting a simple crosswalk can take months, um, if not more than a year or two, to get them actually striped in. Uh, we think that's problematic, as do a lot of other people. Um, this is just a couple of images of different people working on crosswalks. One on the upper left, that's actually the guy in Baltimore on the cover of the night. Um, he actually got support from the city council, who was also fed up with the city's public works department not coming in and striking crosswalks. When this happened, it gained a lot of attention, and it got the attention of the city to the point where they came in very, very quickly after that and said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll put in your sidewalks, your crosswalks. Um, I like the one on the upper right. That's a, an artist and activist in, in Paris. He, it's actually a carpet. He carries it around, and just to prove a point, he'll unroll it to help people cross the street. Um, this is a really wonderful example uh, called Walk Raleigh. Um, that picture on the left there is a, a former grad student uh, named uh, Matt Tomasulu. And he got together with a couple of his friends and they looked at the city's comprehensive plan, they looked at the bike and pedestrian planning, and they said, well great, you've got really good principles and really good ideas and this plan is really progressive on paper, but we're not seeing any real implementation on the ground. And so what they decided to do is make uh, about 30 of these signs and hang them around the downtown. Um, and they call it Walk Raleigh, and they give you information. You know, how long of a walk is it to this location? You know, which direction? And if you want even more information, they put QR codes so you can scan it with your smartphone and find out more. Um, this was a, an unsanctioned, uh, technically illegal initiative that they decided to do in the middle of the night. And what was incredible about this was that it gained international attention within a week. 
Um, it was all over different, you know, urbanism, architecture, design blogs. Uh, the BBC came into the story, and all of a sudden, the city of Raleigh, who didn't even know that the signs were really up there for the first couple of days, were in the spotlight, and they had to decide, well, what the hell do we do about this? All of a sudden, we're, everyone's paying attention to us, and we don't even know who this kid is. Um, so the signs were made for a few weeks while they decided to, how they had to figure out um, what to do with this, all this attention, what to do with the signs. And what was amazing is that they realized that they were actually useful and they were actually consistent with their comprehensive plan and that people liked them. And it was giving Raleigh a good name. And so what, uh, what they did was they said, Matt, you've got to take those signs down, but just we'll get back to you in a week. And within a week's time, the city council had met and they created a pilot program that allows temporary signs. And so his unsanctioned initiative led to an official you know, program at the city that codifies and allows for this kind of work to be done. Um, which I think is great. So that's unsanctioned to sanctioned in just a matter of weeks. This is another project called Build a Better Block. It actually started in Dallas, uh, but some of the pictures here are from Fort Worth, um, which is actually uh, intentional because when you see these projects start in one city, typically the next city to do it is that sister city, the one that's you know, most close by will you know, pick up on that and imitate it and try their own version. And we see that pattern, that one, two, one, two, one, two, with a lot of these tactics. So here's a, a normal block, you know, um, uh, good old fabric, good old buildings, um, you know, fairly nice sized street, but it was vacant and, and dead. And this is um, somewhere near downtown Fort Worth. And so they decided to copy what these kids in Dallas did, which was to mock up and change neighborhood just for a weekend. And they went out there, again in the cover of the night, they painted bike lanes, um, which was actually consistent with the city's bike plan. They had pop-up shops. Um, you know, street cafes, things to do. The course of the day, you know, the street just gets busier and busier, and people really liked it, and the city said, wow, that actually you put those bike lanes in, we've been wanting to do that, that's great. We're really excited by that, and so they went to the, the state DOT, who had jurisdiction over that street, and said, hey, we as a city want to take that street back, we'll maintain it, we want to put those bike, bike lanes in because you're not acting fast enough, and our constituents want that change. So again, that short-term action for that long-term change, that image on the right there is the permanent lanes being striped in. This is Memphis. Uh, Memphis has done the same thing, but this okay, here's the project. It's called A New Face for an Old Broad, Broad Avenue, uh, three and a half or four blocks. Uh, and that's a great name. Um, four blocks that were just completely vacant for the most part. And the two of the businesses that were there, they got together and said, let's do something. We've heard about what Dallas did, we can do it. And they brought 15,000 people to this place over the course of one weekend, 15,000 people. And very, very quickly, those storefronts started to be snapped up, rented, people moving into the storefronts or offices, sorry, the apartments or offices above. Um, you can see some of the new businesses that have opened, the street art. The bike lane there was just meant to be a quote unquote New York style cycle track where they bump the parking off of the curb and put the bike lane between the parking and the curb for protection um, as a weekend experiment. The neighborhood loved it, so it stayed. It stayed there for two years, and then it helped the city um, leverage a, what's called a, a Green Lane Project grant from a national organization that's giving them assistance to make that a very permanent, much more infrastructure-intensive project um, uh, in the neighborhood. And what's incredible is that the, um, the impact of this, according to the city of Memphis, is that one weekend has catalyzed $8 million in private investment. Um, with that 15,000 people who got exposed to the potential, um, you know, it's a pretty amazing thing. And they're now integrating this process, um, you know, build, measure, learn, into their uh, city planning process. So Memphis was the very first city-sponsored initiative using these tactics and these ideas. Um, this is one of my favorite projects, it's called Futuretizing. Uh, that's what we've named it, um, which is advertising the future. And this is on uh, this is in El Paso, Texas. And that city used to have a really, really well-connected, extensive streetcar network that brought people all the way around the city. And uh, an artist named Peter Svarsbein decided to make his senior uh, thesis art project around creating a fake campaign announcing that the streetcar was coming back. Um, so he hung up and he wheat pasted signs with his this conductor um, all over town. And he put them on you know, the vacant buildings, and people started talking, like, wait, wait the streetcar's coming? When's the streetcar coming? It sounds great. And they got really excited about this idea. And it built a massive dialogue in the community in conjunction with a comprehensive planning process that was already underway called Plan El Paso. And um, what Peter was able to do is it brings to the forefront of his community's uh, mind that, yeah, we would like streetcars. That sounds like a good idea. Why do we get rid of them in the first place? Uh, let's bring those back. 
And so they created a plan on you know, one of the first lines where it would go from downtown connecting to the university. And what's incredible, by galvanizing the support and with Peter really pushing on this for the last two or three years, um, in, the, in May they got a $90 million grant from the Texas DOT to actually build out the streetcar line. So there's all these movements afoot to transform parking spaces. This happens to be an event called Parking Day, which started in San Francisco in 2005. And some activists got together, started feeding the meter, and they put up a bench and some uh, astroturf and, and, a, and a tree and made a park, not a parking space. And it's very cheeky, right? And they were doing it kind of to um, raise attention, but they're also proving a point. Why does it have to be, these spaces always have to be for parking? Um, and that just, again, like many of these movements went viral, and there's now International Parking Day, which happens the third Friday of every September, where literally hundreds of cities around the globe uh, participate in, in transforming parking spaces for a day. Um, this actually happens to be Memphis as well. Uh, but that has led to something even more permanent in San Francisco, where it all started, something called parklets, where they take the, that idea and they transform with some fairly cheap materials and they build out these platforms and extend the sidewalk for seating, for bike parking, for plants. Um, and it, they've now done more than, I think, uh, up to 60 of these around the city, which is really, really impressive. And so they're really transforming block by block um, their neighborhoods into more livable and walkable places. And they can't keep up with the demand. The applications for these are through the roof because the businesses tend to do very well um, when these are out front. They tend to be you know, gathering places and they gain great visibility. People start buying um, you know, food, coffee, or whatever. So of course, like good ideas, New York City does it, Vancouver calls it Parallel Park, um, Long Beach, this was an interesting case. This is the first parklet, they have four of them in the city. The business owner had to hire four new people in a month because he was doing such game busters with his coffee shop. This is one that is from North Adams, Massachusetts. It's something that we uh, actually um, uh, stole from an event in, in uh, New Haven. Connecticut, it's called streeting. You take a street or a parking lot and you, you set up a community dining space or a potluck dinner in the middle of the street. Um, and so we were involved with this project called uh, Imagining North Adams, which is a month long of creative place making programming. And on the final night, we wanted to bring people together. We had no idea how we were gonna do that. And so in the course of a couple hours, we decided to build out a space under this overpass, which is usually a pretty dead space in the middle of their downtown. Um, so we invited people to come in. Uh, we took pallets and built out, you can see a little uh, eating and dining area. Uh, the principles that were developed over the course of that month of programming, the vision for, for um, North Adams was then you know, posted right there at the entrance to the, the, the table. So people could understand that this was connected back to that vision process. And we were trying to implement something quickly and bring people together in the public realm. And what was um, interesting is what came of this very quickly was that the business across the street from this parking lot uh, they were a bar, and the light turned on. They said, oh, we didn't know we could do that. We want to do that. So they've now started to apply for um, permits for short-term uses to transform that parking lot um, for a variety of different purposes. And so five questions to ask about any sort of intervention. And this also comes from, um, from Roger Everett's um, innovation principles. You know, what is the project's relative advantage? You know, what are you providing that's not there currently that's going to make this um, exciting and interesting and, and, and valuable for people who would use it? Um, is it simple? The simpler the project we found, the better the, the impact. Um, the more people can just understand it intuitively by seeing what's been done before and after, um, the more it's going to be adopted. The higher the chances that it will actually be adopted for the long term. Again, this idea, can you test it? Can you, if you have a great idea, can you just go out tomorrow and do a prototype or a very you know, um, inexpensive short-term project to see if it, will, if it might um, um, resonate with people? And is it observable? You know, is it in the open? Can people actually keep the tires and understand, is it going to work, is it not going to work? Uh, and finally, again, is it compatible with its surroundings? Um, is this going to be something that's appropriate for, for the neighborhood or the street? So, your mission, if you choose to accept it, and I think that you probably will, is to focus on this area of the city. And again, I, I'm not from Charleston, this is my first time here, I don't know a ton about this, even though I've learned um, uh, some in the last couple of days. But if you zoom in on this area, um, this is Morrison meeting, that intersection, and you know, I had lunch here uh, yesterday, I think I still have the duck sandwich with me, but um, it was really, really good. Um, but this site, to me, just is, is crying out for some interventions, you know, whether that's a, a food, you know, truck, court, 
which comes here on Saturdays that everyone can, can hang out at, whether that's a shipping container market or you know, clipping off this slip street here, making that a whole continuous plaza or it's, you know, a garden or whatever. These ideas can be applied in a number of different ways to even a small little site or area like that, which seems to have activity already, it has some good bones, it has a thriving business, and then the restaurant and the bar. Um, there's a lot that can be done, and there's a lot of creative ideas I think that you all can apply to just this single site, but then all over this area. Um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing you know, what you come up with, and hopefully I can write about your tactics in one of the next volumes. Um, so to close, you know, these great places, they're cultivated. And, you know, design is important. It absolutely is important, especially when you're doing permanent change. But you have to cultivate that change, that understanding of change. You have to work with people to think about how you can make your neighborhood better. Um, it's not just design first. It's about those relationships and that social capital that makes it possible. Um, and so in the end, you can make a difference. And I hope that you do. And thank you for listening.